Uncanny X-Men Annual number 8 is called The Adventures of Lockheed the Space Dragon and His Pet Girl Kitty, and just as the title suggests, it's a very peculiar issue. In this annual, the X-Men and the New Mutants have gathered around a campfire to share some scary stories with each other. The majority of the issue focuses on Ileana's story, and she treats the gang and us to an intergalactic romp through the stars, featuring Kitty as the main character and the X-Men and the Hellfire Club cast in somewhat bizarro versions of themselves. Ileana's story isn't so much scary as it is just like totally out there, and it feels like a watered down version of something that a new applicant of the Midnight Society might try to use as their initiation story. From what I understand, this annual happens sometime in between the last issue's main story and its grim ending. That issue had indicated that Professor X's brutal beating by the bigots at the end took place a few months after the main story of the X-Men fighting the Magus. I used the Marvel Chronology Project to help me sort through these issue sequences, and in case you've never heard of the Chronology Project, it's a website that tells you every chronological appearance of pretty much every Marvel character ever. It's been around forever, and I was shocked to see that it still gets updated today, but it's a great resource, so if anyone is interested in that sort of stuff, then I highly recommend checking it out. Looking at Professor X's chronology, it seems that there are a few issues that take place during that gap that happens in issue number 192, so I'll be reviewing this annual, followed by the X-Men and Alpha Flight miniseries before jumping back into the main Uncanny series. I usually really love X-Men annuals. One of the best parts of an annual or one-shot or special edition is how the story can be relatively standalone and unaffected by whatever else is happening in comic books at that time. You don't necessarily need to be following the main series in order to enjoy an annual. Sometimes we get really epic tales out of these, like the Asgardian Wars and a quest through X-Men's version of Dante's Inferno, and I believe that stories like these are only really achievable because of the straightforward beginning, middle, end nature of an annual's format. All of that said though, this issue didn't really do it for me. Even though I like how an annual's function is mostly just to, like, probe deeper into exploring who the characters are, or to give us a battle featuring characters that wouldn't normally be seen in the X-Men, I kind of felt short-changed by this issue because nothing actually really happened in it. The whole thing was just a visual treatment of Ileana's campfire story, so we didn't really get to know any of the actual characters any better than we already knew them. I mean, that said, an argument can be made that we at least got to see Ileana's opinions of the cast through her imagined versions of them. Or if not necessarily Ileana's opinions, then they are at least what Ileana thinks Kitty's opinions of them might be, since the whole point of Ileana's story is to help improve Kitty's mood. You can see it in the characters that she made out of the White Queen and Storm. They seem to reference Kitty's own opinions of their real-life counterparts, like the fear and disdain that she feels for Emma, and how she views Storm as like the opposite of refined now. But I don't think it can be said that all of the characters in her story are based in her opinions. There are other portrayals where I think Ileana just took like a general creative license and cast some of the characters through a lens that doesn't necessarily reflect her own deep dark thoughts about them. Instead, some of them are just like silly caricatures and exploitations for the sake of her story's narrative, like Rogue being Storm's bodyguard and Professor X being some sort of like royal monarch. So when it comes down to it, other than extrapolating from the story what we can assume to be Ileana's opinions or what she imagines Kitty's opinions to be, there's really not much else in this campfire tale that gives us, the reader, in terms of like deeper character understanding and connection. I mean, the whole issue is essentially a quote-unquote dream episode, if you catch my drift. Nothing drastic or long-lasting happens here that will have any effect in any future issues. Not that annuals always affect future issues anyway, but it's nice to at least end an issue knowing that there's a possibility that something happened here that might go on to affect something else down the road. But with this issue, the most noteworthy thing that happens on a character development scale is a sort of resolution on the romantic issues that have been brewing between Kitty and Colossus. 
and even then it only really feels like a slight step forward for them. Even though I think an issue like this is totally suitable for an annual, I can't help but feel that this annual was kind of wasted on this story. The beauty of annuals is that the writers can get away with doing offbeat experimental things and use weird villains and strange plots that otherwise wouldn't be used in issues of the regular series. And so with this issue not doing really any of that, I can't help but feel that I've missed out on what could have been featured in this annual. I think this annual did accomplish being told in a fun, unusual way, so that was cool, but in the end, it's basically 40 pages of like nothing really happening to the actual characters, and so it basically ends exactly where it began without much tangible adventure of any sort being had by the characters. Some annuals can accomplish being wacky and off the beaten path better than other ones can, and that's the glory of what a contained annual story can give. But while I think this issue is special and unique in its own way, it wasn't really something that I was looking for in terms of a story that I wanted to be told. So that's my overall opinion of X-Men Annual Number 8. I don't really think that it's the greatest in the grand scheme of annual issues, but at least it was creative in resolving the Kitty and Colossus interpersonal drama. It's probably not an annual that I care to pick up and casually read, but it still has some highlights in it, so let's dig into all of that now. Kitty Pride. Even though the title of this issue very explicitly insinuates that Lockheed is going to be the story's main attraction, that really isn't the case in the slightest, and the story instead focuses on his pet girl, Kitty Pride. Ileana's story of how Kitty got involved with Lockheed and the bandits parallels in no great detail Kitty's own journey into how she became involved with the X-Men. Just like in real life, the Kitty in her story starts off as like a wimpy crybaby, but over time she soon evolves into a fierce freedom fighter. I wouldn't say that the real Kitty is necessarily at that same level just yet in her real life, but she certainly is getting there, especially after having hardened up a bit with Wolverine in Japan. The parallels and homages in the story are very easy to figure out. In the story, Kitty comes from a starship called the Chicago, which in real life is Kitty's hometown. She is the daughter of the starship's commander, and she witnesses the entire starship be destroyed by the White Queen, which I think is meant to symbolize how Kitty's own life started getting messed up after both her parents' divorce and after she discovered her mutant abilities. There's a panel of Kitty discovering her abilities in the story by way of falling through a computer system, and I think it's meant to homage one of Kitty's first times using her powers when she fell through the ice cream shop after being spooked by the Hellfire Club in Uncanny X-Men number 129. In both of these instances, her power is activated in a time of extreme fright and nervousness, and I think that just helps drive home the similarities of these two Kitties, both being super new and green to the world of mutant problems. The White Queen actually kills Kitty's parents in this story, which I thought might be Ileana's way of hinting that being a mutant killed her relationship with her parents, but that seems too cruel a point to make even for Ileana. The premise of Ileana's story is all about how Kitty seeks to avenge her parents and destroy the White Queen, but little does this Kitty know that the White Queen is actually hunting her down too. It's very much a cyclical chase like that, and everybody wants to destroy the other one for their own reason. Even though Kitty is the main POV in Ileana's story, I don't necessarily think that she's the most interesting character in it. I'm sympathetic to her plight, and I liked watching her journey into finding strength and confidence within herself, and I know that's the moral that Ileana is trying to impart on Kitty by telling the story, but I just think it all came together too conveniently for her in the end. It felt like on one page she was crying and then suddenly she was this strong, independent woman with like nothing but a splash page in between them telling us instead of showing us how confident she'd become. I mean, I get it. This is a story within a story, so there's only so many panels that can be devoted to it. But it just left me feeling like Kitty's victory was kind of undeserved only because I didn't get to see the actual character growth occur. I'm sure that all of the spacefaring missions she and Lockheed and the gang went on during the time lapse page were great and were totally character building for her, and she shows off her new attitude very forcibly afterwards when she's trying to recruit Storm and telling off the White Queen, 
but I do just wish that we could have seen at least a little bit more of her struggle to get there. Then I might have been more on board with how easily she defeated the White Queen in the end. As far as how Ileana's story affects the real Kitty, it seems to do the trick of cheering her up. She already looked older and more mature and almost like grimmer than the other students her age sitting around the campfire, and while I think that's in small part due to that awful haircut that she's wearing, it's also because she has matured a lot more spiritually than them. She's growing up and crossing over into adulthood, and by the end of this issue, she is inspired enough by Ileana's story to have a very adult conversation with Colossus about their relationship, and how they should be able to remain civil with each other as teammates, even if they aren't lovers. Lockheed Lockheed is the leader of the merry band of space pirates that Kitty joins in Ileana's story. Even though one would think that being designated the leader should give him the most panel time out of everybody, he's actually not really in this issue a whole lot. I was looking forward to seeing what made Lockheed such a badass little dragon in this story, but most of what we're given is just hearsay from people saying how incredible he is, and as opposed to actually seeing him in action and proving it. He's cool in that his mere presence strikes fear into the hearts of the White Queen soldiers enough to make them turn tail and run away, and he does show what he's made of when he's rescuing Kitty from the White Queen herself, but then it's just a bunch of him flapping around and resting on Kitty's shoulders while everybody else talks him up. It was kind of disappointing because I am a Lockheed fan and I am always down for Lockheed-centric story plots, but if he's going to be one of the main players in such a big way here, then he sort of has to be featured doing more and playing a more active role. Midway through, he pretty much just disappears from the story entirely when he's suddenly ambushed by a bunch of other dragons and transported to the dragon world, which is a fine plot point to have your leader kidnapped, but it sucks that it happened at a time when I was really gearing up to see how great of a leader and fighter Lockheed could be. His senses are super well honed in this story, perhaps even more so than Wolverine's are, and even Xavier seems to have trouble reading his mind, as though Lockheed has some sort of like impenetrable psychic defense here or something. Again, it's a lot of big talk about him, and I just wish there was a bit more follow through to see his actual actions, because dang nabbit, this dragon deserves some limelight. It is fun after the crew catches up to him and finds him enjoying the finer things in life in the world of the female dragons, so at the very least we are getting some fun, playful personality bits out of him here, but still, I would have appreciated a bit more action. I mean, he was certainly getting some action, at least according to Nightcrawler and the others, and he was pretty much forced to procreate with the other dragons in order to save their species, but by the look of satisfaction on his face, I don't think forced is really the operative term to use here. All I'm saying, though, is that if the enemies are going to talk him up to be like this big threat in the universe, and the crew is going to talk him up to be this relentless leader, then it's hard to really get into either of those concepts when the focus of the story is so much on Kitty, and we don't really get to see a ton of what Lockheed is capable of. We do get to see Lockheed's ruthless side after he savagely burns the White Queen's crew to smithereens, though, so at the very least, we get a little indication of what everyone is so afraid of when it comes to him. Looks like that fiery passion inside of him burns both ways. Lockheed supposedly dies in this story after he protects Kitty by taking the full blast of the White Queen's ray gun, and at first I was like, why would anyone get in the way between Kitty and something else? Like, she could totally just phase through it. But then I realized, oh, the White Queen was shooting her from behind and Kitty didn't see it. So yes, a very heroic maneuver from Lockheed indeed. And it's through his sacrifice that Kitty realizes Lockheed is her best friend and that she loves him even more than she thought she loved Colossus. This felt a little weird to me too because I was like, well, girl, they are two different kinds of love. Why can't you love them both in their own unique ways? But I guess Kitty just doesn't have that much love to give around because she breaks things off with Colossus in order to properly mourn Lockheed. 
She speaks of their unbreakable bond, and I buy it because I know of their bond in the real world, but I don't really buy it in the narrative of this story because I didn't see them spend nearly as much time together on page as she indicated that they did. Luckily for Lockheed, Kitty's love is strong, and it's through the power of her love that Lockheed is resuscitated, and together they both survive to space pirate another day. I do really enjoy the bond that Kitty and Lockheed have, so it's a happy ending of Ileana's story as far as I'm concerned, and I'm glad that Lockheed got top billing in title of the story, if not necessarily in page time. Colossus Colossus is starting to sound like a tired old record by this point. It's the same narrative of his heart having been wrenched out of his body by Zaji's death and his confusion over what was the right course of action to take regarding his relationship with Kitty. But at least it looks like he's making progress now and is ready to drop the memory of Zaji and start mending bridges back to his lady love Katya. In the story, Ileana makes it a point to mention that Colossus fancies Kitty and that Kitty fancies him back. She's obviously trying to help them reconcile by doing this, as she has a vested interest in their relationship, Colossus being her big brother, and Kitty being her best friend. In the story, Colossus is cast as one of Charles's Imperial Guardsmen. What is with Colossus and getting typecast into this role? First he was a muscly guardsman in the Kulan goth barbarian world, and now he's a muscly guardsman in Ileana's story too. It's like no one can see the versatility that Peter has as a character, but only want to use him instead for his body and his brute strength. I mean, I'd only use him for his body too if given the chance, but that's beside the point. Colossus and Kitty hit it off right away in the story, just like how they did in the real world, but Ileana makes it another point to mention that something's off about the relationship. Even Wolverine notices it, and he shades Colossus hardcore by saying that Colossus is nowhere near Kitty's league. I guess Ileana can get away with smart remarks like that in her story because she's Colossus' sister, but I would have loved a little cutscene to Colossus at the campfire here to see what his reaction was when he heard Ileana say that. Things go pretty fine for Colossus and Kitty up until the end when she breaks up with him and pretty much blames their relationship for causing Lockheed's quote-unquote death. I think in this moment, Kitty was thinking back to how distracted she was when she had first met Colossus. Lockheed had flown off to investigate something and she didn't go with him. Maybe she's thinking that if she hadn't been so concerned with her own libido, then she would have been able to accompany him and then he never would have been teleported to Dragon World and then this whole debacle could have been avoided. That's a bit of an extreme overreaction in my opinion, because Lockheed is an independent dragon and he made his own decision here. But still, Kitty doesn't really see it that way, and she shifts some of the blame onto both herself and to Colossus. It's almost kind of like role reversal here for these two. Ileana has flipped the script of what actually happened between the real Kitty and Colossus, where Colossus broke up with Kitty over the death of someone that he loved, Zaji. Back then, Colossus was the one who broke Kitty's heart, and it was Kitty who just kind of had to deal with it. I think this might have been Ileana's way of avenging Kitty's pride and self-esteem here, and like throwing it back in her brother's face to see how he liked it. I think Colossus even understood that too, as later he and Kitty talk, and he draws the comparison of how in the story, the Kitty, Colossus, and Lockheed characters were similar to the real-life Kitty, Colossus, and Zaji scenario. I don't think the comparison is true for like the entire duration of the story, but I think in that moment of Kitty grieving Lockheed and breaking up with Colossus, the comparison is dead on, and it's probably a schooling moment for Colossus to understand how Kitty really felt in that moment. I personally can't wait for the day where I don't have to mention Zaji ever again. She never made any official appearances in any of these X-comics, yet it feels like I keep mentioning her name anytime Colossus comes up, which just goes to show how much of a broken heart I guess he must have over the situation. But I think this should hopefully be the last time I have to mention her, because at the end of this issue, it does feel like Colossus and Kitty pretty much resolve their issues, and they can both stop moping about the other person now. Kitty has grown past her heartbreak, and she's ready to call Peter a friend at last. Her heartbreak is what drove her to Japan with Wolverine, and it seems like Japan is where all the X-Men go to rediscover themselves. 
So now that she's back, she's kind of taking a cue from Storm and has hardened up a bit and is finally able to live a superhero life that doesn't have her emotions fully on her sleeve all the time. In a way, we have Colossus to thank for that. I know breaking up with her was a cruel way for her to discover more about herself, but in the end, I think it was definitely for the best. In my opinion, the time she spent with Wolvie in Japan is definitely the turning point for her character, and it's when she really starts becoming great and compelling. Ileana. There isn't really a whole lot to say about Ileana in this issue, other than she's the architect of what ultimately becomes a bridge of common ground between Kitty and Colossus. She sees that both her brother and her best friend are down in the dumps, and she knows that the only way they'll be happy is if they are together again, so she goes out of her way to create this really extravagant and fantastical space story, pretty much only with the intent of it helping these two find one another again. I mean, that's commitment. I'd say she did a pretty good job of disguising it and making it feel like it was a story for everyone, and surely there is something for everyone in it, like Storm, but at the heart, it's definitely Ileana trying to steer Colossus and Kitty back together, if not as lovers, then at least as teammates and friends. In the story, Ileana casts herself as the ship, which I think is very appropriate, considering that she is the one telling the story that contains all these characters, just like the ship physically contains them in the story. It could also be an homage to her teleporting mutant power too, going from place A to place B, just like how the ship does that. As the ship's persona, she just kind of pops up conveniently to fill in the blanks or add new exposition where needed, which I think is a great cop-out device for a storyteller to use, so bravo, Liliana. I mean, other than telling the story and accomplishing her mission of reuniting Kitty and Colossus, there's really not much else to say about Ileana in this issue, which is funny considering that, technically speaking, she's the character driving the entire issue forward by telling the story in the first place. But ah well, it's a nice thing Ileana did and it shows just how much she cares for Kitty and the others, even if she is a soulless demon girl. Storm. Storm has one of the more heartwarming character stories in this annual because you can see the direct comparison between the fictional character and the real Storm, and how the real Storm changes in the end by way of listening to her fictional counterpart's journey. In the beginning of this issue, the real Storm is still brooding over her power loss. She's not outright complaining to anyone about it, but it's super obvious that it's on her mind just in the way she like mopes around carrying sticks. She's not exactly the funnest person to be around these days, and even though it feels like everyone's concerned about her, there's no denying that she's just bringing down the mood. She makes her appearance in the second half of Ileana's story, and it's quite the scathing caricature. In the story, Storm has the reputation of being a renowned pilot who was nicknamed the Star Rider, which is an obvious play off the commonly used Wind Rider phrase that's attributed to her. But when Kitty goes to find her and ask her for help, it's revealed that Storm is now just a washed up pilot who has lost her abilities and has instead taken to becoming a full-time drunk. It's a funny comparison for Ileana to make because the way she portrays Storm in her story is like so different and out there from how Storm would normally carry herself. The drinking thing in particular is really off, but I like that she made a bit of a caricature of Storm to make her seem more relatable in the story. It's also kind of funny, particularly since Storm only recently developed a bit of a taste for alcohol since having sipped some champagne for the first time with Forge back in Uncanny X-Men number 186. After that, she was called out by Xavier for drinking too much at her going away party in Uncanny X-Men number 189, and now here we are just a few issues later, and she's already being cast as a full-on drunkard. Anyway, the general idea of what Ileana is trying to communicate here is very palpable in this portrayal of Storm. It's a reflection of Storm's behavior since she lost her powers, or at the very least it's Ileana's perception of how Storm has been behaving. I think the general message that Ileana is trying to send here is that Storm is being too sulky, and it's time for her to snap back into character. The Storm in the story sees herself as a degraded version of what she once was since she no longer has her abilities, and that's exactly what the real Storm's opinion of herself is too. In the story, Storm says that she can't fly anymore, which I think doesn't necessarily mean like fly fly as she's used to doing, but instead it's just like she's lost her skill to pilot effectively or something. 
but whatever it is, it is of course a reference to Storm having lost her weather powers in real life and thus feeling as though she's incapable of leading the X-Men. Kitty gives her an impassioned speech though, and it rejuvenates Storm's soul and she agrees to help out, but when the time comes, Storm's nerves get the best of her and she pulls out. It takes Kitty revealing her diamond arm to convince Storm that she's not the only one who is missing a part of herself. Kitty's arm is diamond, but she still carries on, and Storm has to learn to carry on too. This moment shows Storm that, while her situation is unique and that she's lost a very specific ability and no one can possibly know how deeply that affects her, she's not the only person out there who's lost something. People lose parts of themselves in one way or another all the time, and there's nothing so special about Storm so as to set her apart from others who are still carrying on and living their lives even though parts of them are missing too. I think this is the moment in the story that is kind of like a wake-up call for the real Storm. She realizes that she has to stop sulking over what she doesn't have any control over anymore and start focusing on the things that she does. And of course, in this story, it turns out Storm still does have the talent and skill to pilot and accomplish the task at hand. She may be missing whatever innate ability it was that she lost, but that doesn't make her any less capable a person, and I think that's the message that Ileana wanted Storm to glean. She is still fully capable of leading the X-Men, even though she doesn't have her weather powers. After the story, Storm seems to catch all of Ileana's drifts and acknowledges that she's been behaving a bit self-pityish. She doesn't claim that she wants to leave the X-Men again though, and instead she hints that she'll try to leave again. The first time she tried to set sail to Africa was when Kulan Goth's spell got in the way back in Uncanny X-Men number 190, but maybe second time's the charm for her, and if leaving's what she's gotta do to find herself and stop being so sulky, then all the power to her. Wolverine. Wolverine is as perceptive as ever in this issue. He's also more articulate than ever too, which is a little bit weird for him. The issue opens with him telling a story over the campfire, and he's weirdly articulate while he does it. Wolverine is usually a man of few words, and those few words are usually just growls and bubs, so it was strange seeing him behave this way kind of out of nowhere. The issue itself does acknowledge his sudden articulate upgrade though, which I appreciate, and then after I thought about it, I do actually think that it would make sense that Wolverine would be a great storyteller. He's lived such an expansive life that he should have no shortage of stories to tell, and he's got that, like, man of the woodedness to him that doesn't lend itself to everyday conversation, but does lend itself to being able to tell captivating campfire stories. His story was about a Japanese assassin who gave up love and happiness because she was too married to her sword, and Kitty calls him out on it because she sees the obvious parallel he's making from his story to her own life. It was clearly a reference to her running away from her romantic problems with Colossus to learn how to become a samurai, but she doesn't seem to be bothered by it. I don't know if he was trying to cheer her up or just trying to help get his point across, but whichever one it was, I don't think it worked as she just looks as down in the dumps as ever after he finishes. He is perceptive though, and he knows that she needs cheering up even if he can't necessarily be the one to do it. He doesn't seem to have much faith in Ilyana's storytelling abilities either though, and he makes a cute bet with Stevie Hunter where he predicts that Ilyana's story won't make Kitty laugh. He's right in the end and Stevie has to pay up, but they both notice that it looks like Ileana's story did more good than just failing to deliver on a belly laugh as it gave Kitty and Storm and Colossus some space to sort out all the issues that are going on in their lives. White Queen the White Queen is the main antagonist in this story's story, and she is pretty much just like a carbon copy reference of the Hellfire Club's own White Queen, Emma Frost. Her personality and attitude is just as ferocious and brutal as Emma's is, and she seeks to kidnap Kitty and either make her a slave or kill her or become her or something like that. It's not really super clear what her intentions are. Her intentions sort of seem to change over the course of the story, as first she wants to use Kitty for her power, and then at the end she's trying to transfer psyches with her, so that's a bit confusing. But regardless, this White Queen's motive is also very parallel of Emma Frost's own desire to have Kitty in her clutches somehow. 
What was most interesting for me was how the White Queen had the power to turn Kitty's arm into what I assumed was Diamond. This issue happens years before Emma's secondary mutation to turn into a diamond form was even on the radar. So to me, this was like a fun prophesying element of something that would eventually become like a key component of Emma Frost's character. I'm not totally sure if this White Queen was using diamond or if that was just ice, because it's never actually called out that it was diamond that she turned Kitty's arm into, or that it was diamond that she turned the parents into. I'm just kind of assuming that it was, probably because of my own bias based on the Emma of today. The only instance that we have of knowing what element she's harnessing is when she freezes Wolverine in some ice, so if I go by the evidence that's on the page, then there's a chance that none of this stuff was diamond whatsoever and it was all just ice. That would make sense in terms of how the writer is characterizing this white queen. She's sort of like supposed to have a heart of ice, I think, and so giving her ice-related abilities makes a bit more sense than Diamond. But since we don't know one way or the other, I choose to see Diamond, and so Diamond they shall be. And if it is actually Diamond, then I wonder if Emma's secondary mutation was always like a part of the plan of the character's growth, or if it might have even been inspired by this issue. And if that is the case, then I totally eat my words about saying that this annual doesn't have any real long-lasting legacy of any sort, because that would be some impressive foreshadowing. The part that I'm really overanalyzing with the White Queen, though, is at the beginning, when she took control of Kitty's home ship and her parents. I talked in detail about how I felt that this story part was meant to reference how Kitty's mutant power changes her life forever, and I wonder if Ileana casting the White Queen as the Devastator here is meant to mirror that Ileana views Emma as the true person who really ruined Kitty's life. Emma has been gunning for Kitty even before the X-Men made first contact with her, and there was a brief period of time where Kitty was actually enrolled at Emma's school, so it's not like Emma hasn't had a hand in how Kitty's life has been shaped. By having the White Queen destroy Kitty's ship and kill her parents, it might just go to show that Ileana is really placing the blame on Emma Frost for all the terrible things that have happened to Kitty. The White Queen has a pretty brutal end in Ileana's story, and she ends up being eaten by a pack of dragons, which is like super ghastly for a fairy tale and I didn't expect it at all, but there's no denying that this White Queen sort of had it coming, given that she did kill a Lockheed lookalike dragon by herself earlier anyway. I guess what ultimately ends up happening to Queenie here is just something called sweet revenge, and I'm sure the dragon community would agree with me. Black King. The Black King isn't really featured in the story a whole lot, but he stuck out in a way that was sort of interesting to me, in that he wasn't really interesting at all. His only real impact in this story was when he helped the White Queen escape Lockheed's fiery wrath, and whenever he went hunting for Lockheed and Kitty during the great final battle. And even then, in both of those instances, he didn't really have too much of an impact. That sticks out to me because the Black King as we know him, aka Sebastian Shaw, is totally different than that. Instead of being like the Lord Imperial and in charge of this story as he basically is in real life, this Black King is actually much more of like a lackey to the White Queen instead of being a leader. Even though I'm just assuming that this Black King is supposed to be a reference to Shaw, I'm sure that it is, and I actually think that it's purposely meant to be a mockery of him. Sebastian is strong and willful, and this Black King is like totally subservient and at times almost like fearful of the White Queen. He's not craven per se, but he does seem to have a bit more cower in him than usual, and I mean, none of this is really in line with who Sebastian Shaw is as a character. But again, I think that might be the point. Ileana could just be painting this guy to be craven as like an insult to Sebastian's reputation. He doesn't even really look a whole lot like Sebastian either, so I was having trouble drawing that explicit parallel, but I still think it's him. If this character is supposed to be a mockery, then I do think it's a clever little detail to make him like the opposite of how Sebastian Shaw really is, since so many of the other characters in this story are like straight up representations of who they actually are. Panels. Here are my top picks of cute, funny, or clever little moments that I liked in this issue. 5. Xavier getting catcalled for trying to cut the camp out short. 
Leave it to Charlie to have yet another bad idea for the team that merits boos and hisses. 4. Lockheed in a dragon battle royale. He's wrestling with these female wranglers, and one of them has got his wing in the ultimate dragon sleeper hold. 3. Lockheed whipping Kitty with his tongue. Kitty is prone to outbursts, and she's gotten herself so worked up here that Lockheed figures the only way to calm her down is to lash out at her, literally. 2. Kitty getting hit on in the space bar. I don't know what that alien said to her, but it looks like a good time to me, and it was enough to make Kitty blush, so it can't be anything too scandalous. 1. My favorite panel in this issue is Kitty and Lockheed imagining what the other would look like as one of their species. Lockheed's rendition, I can totally understand. It's pretty basic dragon. But for Kitty, yikes, is this the kind of guy she's after? I mean, I'm totally here for it, and it looks like Kitty's human Lockheed is the kind of guy who knows how to have a good time, especially wearing that crop top. My favorite noise in this issue is Kitty's ARG after she hears the title of Ilyana's story. She isn't taking too kindly to being addressed as Lockheed's pet girl, although I'm sure Lockheed isn't taking as much issue with it as she is. Fashion in this issue, I'm highlighting one of Kitty's famous fashion shows. It's a recurring gag in the X-World that Kitty changes her costume like every other issue, and usually her taste is not of the highest caliber. This little fashion show that Kitty puts on happens kind of out of nowhere between the splash page of Kitty becoming a true space pirate and right before they set down on Xavier's palace. She's trying to figure out what to wear, and she wants to be impressive, so she tries on something toga-y, then a cute little Judy Jetson number, before finishing with like this severe sci-fi moment. These outfits were designed by Trina Robbins, who is somewhat of a legend in the comics world, and she was the creator of the famous Vampirella costume, which... I'm not a Vampirella reader, but I certainly bought a lot of wizard magazines in my heyday, and I feel almost intimately familiar with this costume because of those magazines. In the end though, Kitty doesn't go with any of these fashionable moments, and instead just chooses to meet Xavier wearing what looks to be her usual garb, and though it's enough to catch the eye of Colossus, I think it's a crying shame that she didn't at least use number three of that fashion parade. Now that was a look. At This issue, I'm highlighting the Oreo Cookie Search and Find coloring page ad. Like, right away, cookie sensory overload. This ad invites the reader to find as many hidden Oreo cookies as they can that are hidden all throughout this picture, and then for added bonus fun, the reader can color the picture too. I started to look for every Oreo just to see how I'd get along, but I lost count the moment I got to that busy wallpaper. Yikes. Oreo mania. I mean, the more you look at this ad as a whole, the uglier it really gets. The cat has Oreos for eyes, and the lamp is just one giant Oreo cookie, and even the dials on the TV are Oreos. It's definitely treading the line between campy and kitschy and just plain awful. I like Oreos, I'm not obsessed with Oreos, but I never really noticed or paid much attention to the design that's actually on the cookie. It's got like a circle with some sort of cross thing pointed out of it. It looks kind of like an antenna or something to me. Nothing about that design screams Oreo, and it actually looks like something that would be branded on me if I joined an Oreo cult. I did a cursory Google search to see what was up with this design, and I guess this is actually the Nabisco logo, which is supposed to be the European symbol meaning quality. The cross coming out of the circle is supposedly the Cross of Lorraine, which was something carried by the Knights of Templar, who did some massive slaughtering during their heyday. So yeah, I'm just not going to touch this one. Good luck to you, Oreo. Well, that's it for this issue. Thanks for tuning in. This issue wasn't my favorite, but at least it was unique. Please feel free to check around my YouTube channel for more content like this. I upload reviews and spoilers and solicit speculations, so there's something for the whole X family. You can also follow me on social media for a splattering of other random X content, namely panel scans with funny quips. 
Thanks for stopping by today and listening to me ramble, and be sure to come back again soon from our great Xmentations.